thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, join Gandhi in uh, co-chairing uh, this square table or round table uh, this morning. And as he mentioned, the focus of our discussion uh, is on the ingredients in building and fostering uh, and nurturing uh, economic success of indigenous uh, communities. Uh, Andrew mentioned uh, the, some of our members who are engaged at the local provincial level with indigenous leaders and communities and quite a number of our members as you can well imagine uh, are uh, engaged in those relationships whether they be with cultural awareness programs youth mentorship, internships, and apprentice programs, supporting National Days of Reconciliation, scholarships, environmental studies, pre-placement training, capacity building, and university chairs and research projects. Not to mention the significant number of projects uh, which fall on indigenous lands and which offer equity partnerships as well as significant employment, training, and procurement opportunities for indigenous peoples and companies. And I think it's also good to note uh, the rise of indigenous uh, entrepreneurs, which I think uh, are making and will continue to make an appreciable difference when we talk about creating economic well-being for those communities. Um, currently, uh, there are some hundred major electricity projects on indigenous lands with an estimated capital expenditure of around $50 billion. There's another almost 200 potential projects on the drawing boards valued at between $120 and $140 billion. I believe that these projects potentially, in collaboration with indigenous peoples, can be legacy projects. Professor Kotler uh, talked about Mr. Martin's legacy. Uh, we think that if done right, uh, these projects can rightly earn uh, legacy status uh, in uh, <coughs> Aboriginal communities. So one of my tasks uh, is to try to align very early the Aboriginal or Indigenous chiefs and CEOs uh, in a spirit of collaboration and mutual respect going both ways. Um, and if we do that, I believe that the economic benefits that potentially can flow uh, are, are significant. And I think they're transformational as well. On our part, I think when I uh, talk to our companies, uh, I think we can do a better job of starting those discussions and consultations much earlier in the project's uh, development uh, so that you build trust from the word get-go as opposed to perhaps uh, after uh, things have uh, uh, hit the, the public pages. And also, I think, in talking with our companies to be more inclusive, in other words, to go outside the immediate uh, circle of what you need to do and enter the possibilities of what you could or should uh, also do. Uh, studies show that um, indigenous peoples in Canada, if they were to reach the same education and employment level as other Canadians, Canada's GDP would increase by $400 billion by 2026. And when I think of that figure, um, it's an astounding figure, $400 billion. But the challenge, of course, and we all know that, is in the if, right? Because indigenous peoples, regrettably, currently do not enjoy the same education and employment levels and that obviously leads to an enormous and critical gap between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples uh, in our country. Uh, and you'll all know uh, Chief Belgard talks about it in almost every speech that I've heard him give, where he talks about uh, the UN putting Canada 
between sixth or eighth in the world in terms of uh, index of, of living, quality of life. And uh, Chief Belgard is fond, uh, and rightly so, in making his point, of course, in saying that if you were to transfer those measurements to just indigenous peoples in Canada, that that would drop to number 63, or between 63 and 78. And so the picture that he conjures up for us is a, is a rather stark one, right? Six and 78. And that uh, dysfunctional gap, uh, I think, is the challenge uh, for, uh, for us and for our discussion uh, this morning. It's, it's rather a daunting uh, gap. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that profound gulf should motivate us uh, to ask ourselves how can employment and training and of course education be addressed in an effort to harness uh, the power of, of those three uh, disciplines so that we can truly and substantially begin, not to begin, but to bridge that enormous gap that exists. We can't talk about economic success without bridging that gap. Uh, in terms of format, Andrew wanted me to let you know that we're first going to hear from Senator uh, Murray Sinclair, and then the panelists that he's assembled. Uh, they will collectively provide us all with, I'm sure, a fulsome uh, overview of their perspectives of the T TRC report as it relates to those three areas of employment, training, and education. Uh, and that should take about the first hour or so, and then we will have <coughs> the second hour dedicated to comments and questions uh, from all of our participants. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to my co-chair, who will ably introduce our speaker and panelist. I will return as the bad cop in this routine mm -hmm. to put the brakes on our speaker so that all of you can have uh, uh, a few words as well. So over to my co-chair. <laughs> I'm just saying in my language of Kanyakeha that I'm sending you greetings from my people, uh, the Kanyakeha people. Um, and I want to acknowledge that we are on unceded Algonquin territory and that I'm a guest here. And in the last two years, or since I started working at Carleton, um, they've treated me very well. So um, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce uh, Marie St. Clair, Senator St. Clair who tells me that he remembers me as a baby running around in my diaper. <laughs> 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 um, so we have a, a long history. <laughs> <laughs> so as you all know, Senator uh, Murray St. Clair was appointed to the Senate earlier this year, uh, which is wonderful, wonderful. I can't imagine a, a more qualified and more uh, well-suited person for this, this kind of work uh, to help us. Um, after three years of having chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, which has produced a very comprehensive and far-reaching report, Senator St. Clair was appointed to the Associate um, Chief Judge of the Provincial Court of Manitoba in, the Mar in March of 1988 and the Court of Queen's Bench of Manitoba in January of 2001. He was Manitoba's first Indigenous judge in Manitoba, and uh, Justice St. Clair attended the universities of Winnipeg and Manitoba, uh, in 1979, he graduated from the Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba and was called to the Manitoba Office in 1980. So in 1988, Justice Sinclair was appointed co-commissioner of Manitoba's Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. And in November of 2000, uh, Justice Sinclair completed the report of a pediatric cardiac surgery, surgery inquest. Um, and among other things, which has led up to uh, why we're here today to enjoy to speak and share with us so that we can move forward um, collectively in this process of reconciliation. So Senator Sinclair, the floor is yours. Good morning. Bonjour. Uh, good morning to all of you. I don't know many of you, but 
I, uh, I greet you all. Look forward to hearing some of your comments. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'll get right into what it was that I was asked to talk to you about because we have a very tight day in which we're going to uh, thank you in which we're going to uh, solve the problems of this country. <laughs> I want to um, first of all just begin by uh, answering what's on everybody's mind, and that is, why would I go to the Senate? So <laughs> <laughs> and it's, by, it's a bit of a plug as well for uh, what it is that we're trying to achieve there, because it was about this very question, the importance of the calls to action for the TRC, and the work needed in order to improve the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people that I chose to accept the request to uh, respond to the, re the uh, summons to join the Senate. Uh, because I, I have always seen the Senate of this country as like a council of elders in our community, who are the ones who should be there to give guidance to the leaders, the ones who are responsible for acting in the interests of the people. And if, uh, if we can return to that concept, if we can keep that concept, or if we can give that concept to my colleagues, I think we'll be a better place. So I, uh, I want to try to promote that idea because this country needs to see the Senate in that, in that way. Um, <coughs> it's always hard to know how to cram all of that report into the time frame that I'm given. So uh, I'm going to have to make some assumptions that you've said, you've seen some of it, you've read some of it. Uh, but I acknowledge that you have likely not read all of it because the final report for the Commission is uh, several thousand pages long. It's in seven different volumes. And the summary report, such as we called it, is over <coughs> 300 pages. Uh, so uh, we actually wrote a summary of the summary report. So just for your benefit, so the summary of the summary report is 180 pages long. And even that proved daunting for other people. So the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has written the summary of the summary of the <laughs> summary, <laughs> which uh, runs to about 90 pages. So if you want some easy reading, go to the National Center for <coughs> Truth and Reconciliation and ask for their document entitled A Knock at Night and uh, A Knock at the Door at Night. And uh, you'll get a copy of their summary of the summary of the summary of our final report. In addition to that, we have a number of videos which I think aptly uh, tells the story of the residential school legacy. <coughs> and there's one in particular uh, which is available through the National Center called the TRC Final video, which uh, I commend to your viewing and to share, in fact, with your colleagues, your employees, with people uh, whom you want to uh, educate in, the, in a tight time frame. And that, uh, that particular video not only captures what the report is about, it also captures what the story is about. But let me uh, proceed on the assumption you haven't seen all of that and tell you this. The uh, history of residential schools in this country is one of the uh, sad legacies of Canada's uh, desire to change Indigenous people into something that they were not meant to be. Uh, I'm going to talk about the role of education generally in the course of my comments, but the, 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 it's important to understand the, the nature of the relationship that the education has had and the impact that education has had upon that relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Uh, there, and there are some, several aspects to it, the social relationship, the political relationship, as well as the legal relationship. Up until Confederation, the relationship was generally one of legal equals, uh, social challenges, of course, created by uh, the growing dependency on the uh, North American economy created by the fur trade and by other kinds of industries that have come to dominate the uh, societies of the time. Um, and a political relationship that was deteriorating. Uh, deteriorating since the Royal Proclamation of 1763, 
The Royal Proclamation of 1763 was a document that was issued by the King of England primarily towards indigenous peoples, the Indian tribes as the document refers to them, in order to appease them and to keep the peace between England and Indian tribes after the French-English War that was resolved through uh, treaty in 1761. And so the Indian tribes, some of whom had participated on the French side in North America, some of whom had participated on the English side, and many of whom had been neutral during uh, that, uh, that war, were very concerned about the impact of the English crown being now the dominant European presence of all the European nations that had come to be present in North America. And there was agitation growing between them and, and towards the crowd. And so the King of England, uh, and it was primarily over the issue of land, incidentally, so you know <coughs> what the Royal Proclamation was really about. Because uh, land speculators, particularly from the American side, were trying to take over and develop uh, American Indian land. And so the English crown were uh, was very careful to issue a proclamation trying to settle the concerns of the American, uh, the North American indigenous leadership and saying to them, don't worry, we won't interfere with you, we won't take your lands from you, you will continue to have your rights and continue to be in charge of your territory and we will control our people from infringing upon your territory. In a summary way, that's what the the document said. <coughs> and that document was then explained to about 3,800 indigenous leaders who came to a gathering or a series of gatherings at uh, Fort Niagara in 1764. And those series of gatherings have been documented by the English side as well as by the indigenous side through their various wampum belts and other forms of acknowledgement of the relationship, but it was uh, it's commonly referred to as the Treaty of Niagara and, and 1764. And so that relationship uh, that was spelled out in the Royal Proclamation that was intended by the Crown was confirmed with Indigenous leaders in North America in 1764. And as I said, the relationship was intended to be, we won't interfere with your land, so don't worry. Um, if you want to surrender, lands to us, you have to do it through a Crown representative, and not to speculators. <coughs> Americans, of course, didn't like that because land de developers were interested in getting a hold of the land, and that directly led to the American Revolution that was split from, uh, from England in uh, 1776 or thereabouts, um, and the war leading up to it. Um, and and it also led to the attempted <coughs> invasion of Canada in the 1800s, the War of 1812. So all of that agitation over land was a, a significant feature of the post Royal Proclamation era. And I say all of that to you because that's the kind of pressure that the relationship came under right from the beginning, and in fact continues to be under. The whole issue of land control of land, sovereignty over land, the right to territory, the right to resources in the territory, has been at the forefront of the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people from the beginning. That's all background to what was going to occur after Confederation in 1867. Up until 1867 in Canada, the Crown had held generally to its statement in the Royal Proclamation of not interfering with indigenous lands, indigenous lands holding indigenous territory, um, but it created Canada. And in creating Canada, they created a legal entity with uh, certain sovereignties that allowed <coughs> the country to take over the decision making with regard to the relationship with indigenous people. And their responsibility for that relationship fell on the shoulders of the federal government by virtue of Section 9124 of the Constitution Act of 1867. Sir John A. Macdonald was a very strong advocate for Canadian expansion into the West. And remember that the western part of what is now Canada was not included in the original <coughs> Confederation and wanted, wanted that to be included. 
and therefore he wanted to expand the boundaries of Canada in that direction. In order to do that, he had to deal with the issue of Indian title. And that was spelled out in, in a series of documents, including the, Royal Proc uh, the uh, British North America Act of 1870, which created the province of Manitoba, the Rupert's Land Purchase Agreement, which allowed the Canadian government to buy the Hudson's Bay Territory from the Hudson's Bay Company, all of which contained provisions which said that the government of Canada had to deal with Indian land rights, Indian title, before they could expand into the West. So the treaty-making process was a legal obligation Canada had to undertake after Confederation. And so that's why the treaties <coughs> after Confederation started so quickly with uh, the Manitoba Act, of course, but also the treaty, the, the treaty number one, treaty number two, treaty number three, <coughs> all of which, when you look at them, look like land purchase agreements. And from a lawyer's perspective, <coughs> you look at a land purchase agreement, and from the indigenous side, they rely upon this document as a sacred reflection of their relationship, and therefore not to be lightly dealt with. And from a lawyer's perspective, you look at it and they say, this is strictly a land purchase because it defines land, it defines territory, it says this is <coughs> how much you're going to get, and this is what we're going to do. And the government did approach it on that way. It was originally, the treaties were originally intended simply to be land transfer agreements. Uh, but there were problems initially at the treaty number one, the very first treaty negotiation, because the Indian negotiators came to the territory, came to the discussion with a number of other demands, including a demand for uh, creation of schools in their communities so that their children could be educated. So all of the treaties that were signed after Confederation with the indigenous people of Western Canada contained a schools clause. And in the schools clauses, the government of Canada undertakes to build schools on the reserves that were being set aside for the indigenous tribes so that their children could be educated. And when you look at the record the negotiations from the indigenous perspective, they very clearly say, we want our children to be educated so that they can be as educated as the, as the white children of this country and be able to, to allow us to contribute and receive the benefits of being part of this nation. And, uh, and so the negotiators on the indigenous side were very clear they wanted their children to be educated, but they did not want to give up the sovereignty of their territory. They did not want to give up their culture and language. That was also very clear. The government of Canada saw it differently or took advantage of that promise by saying, we can't build schools everywhere, so we're going to build a few schools. They're going to be residential type schools, boarding schools, using the American model. And um, they, they proceeded to do that virtually while they were negotiating these uh, other treaties with school clauses, promising to build schools on the reserve. They were building these boarding schools, which we've come to know as Indian residential schools. Indian residential schools were intended to take the children away from the families and place them into institutions not so much to educate them, but to indoctrinate them. And the intention was to indoctrinate them into a different culture, to take away their language and teach them only French or English, and to ensure that they would be able to be easily assimilated into Canadian society. That was the intention behind the schools. And the schools um, interfered significantly in the relationship between the children and their families, the children and the culture, the children and their community and, of course, children and their identity. And we all understand, I think, the importance of education, not just to development of skills to be able to compete in the workforce. If that's all that schools were about, then everybody would be equally employable. But schools are also about helping you to learn who you are, helping you to find <coughs> a place in life, helping you to find out what your history is, not just as a person, but as a people, to find out what your people have done, to find out who your heroes are, who the villains are of the past, what your historical relationships have been with other people. So understanding 
all of that, what your full history is, is part of what education and, and an educational system is intended to give you. And all indigenous tribes had a process by which you would receive that education. So they would talk about uh, what it meant to be a Dakota person or a Mohawk or a, a Anishinaabe or a Cree because the elders would always tell those stories. I remember the very first time I was hired as a lawyer after law school. The very first job I ever had was uh, was hired by the chiefs of Manitoba to conduct uh, educational programs for all of the First Nations in Manitoba to teach them about the new constitution that was coming into, <coughs> play, into play. This was in 1980, 1981. And so my obligation, my role was to educate people in the communities about what the Constitution was all about. And so we developed a team and we went around and conducted workshops on the Constitution. The first time I went to a community to do that was the Dakota community of Sioux Valley. Sioux Valley First Nation and its uh, Dakota leadership have a very unique history in Canada. And they listened to me for about an hour and a half and then we took a break. And then after the break, or during the break, one of the elders of the community, uh, and when I started in Sandy, all of the elders were in the front row, and there were about 40 or 50 of them sitting in the front row. Everybody else was seated behind them. Um, and after the first break, after I had started and done my spiel, they asked if I would listen to what they had to say first before I continued, and so I said I would. And then after the break, they then started to tell me their history as a Dakota people, starting with the person on the far left, and it went all the way across. And my uh, six-hour workshop turned into a four-day learning experience. I stayed with them for four days because they told me the complete history of the Dakota people in North America. And then at the end of it, they said, now that's our constitution. Why don't you go and teach them about that first? <laughs> <coughs> and, and each of the tribes has a similar kind of experience where they, they spend the time, they take the time, and they teach their children that. In the community of Split Lake in northern Manitoba, it's one of the communities where the provincial court, when I was associate chief judge in the provincial court, it had the lowest crime rate of all the indigenous communities in Manitoba. And so we went there to figure out what their solution was. Their first solution, they told us, was they kicked out all the churches, except for one. There are seven church buildings in Split Lake. Seven buildings where you can go to church on a Sunday, or any day of the week, for that matter. All of them are run by the Anglican Church. They let the Anglican Church come in. They said they threw out all the other churches because they just confused the people. So they have one Christian organization that runs the church services in their community. But the real secret, they say, is that every month, every month, at the end of the month, they have a community feast where they feast all the elders. And all the elders they define as anybody who's a grandmother, anybody who's a grandfather, 